Welcome everybody to the University of Applied Research and Development. This is our emergency response and risk management videocast. It is our delight today to have with us one of our contributing faculty, Yunus Imam, who is a trainer, a developer, uh, a graduate in emergency response. We are delighted to have you with us, Yunus. Hello. Uh, nice to meet you, everybody, today. And uh, today we're going to be going over uh, our uh, Salam project presentation on active attacker, uh, what you can do organizations. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is a very basic concept, which is uh, how our Salam security team, how uh, our law enforcement professionals uh, advise these organizations to set up their security teams. So the basic uh, internals of it is a three, uh, three team structure. It's an internal team, uh, an outside team or a parking patrol team, and a, a camera operator. During the, so when, during mass events, the parking patrol team would uh, go, uh, would uh, be observing what's going on, and if they see a threat, they would uh, warn the internal team and the camera operator with radios. The camera operator would be in charge of calling police and uh, collecting all evidence, making sure you're getting a visual, and uh, letting the internal team know. Now, the internal team has a very simple set of procedures. Uh, what they do is they would lock down certain areas of the building, that, that means taking, for example, there's a door stopping or door jamming devices that you can utilize, which uh, secure doors. And then they would uh, direct all attendees of the mosque or the church or the school uh, to evacuate through the back, the back doors, wherever that is from the attacker. Right? And uh, we have other tools like controlled access. So uh, in the financial industry where I work, we have tools where we can have a guard stationed at an entrance and they will only unlock a door when they see the person in front of them and they see maybe their identification. Another thing that we need to be uh, under uh, understanding of, of during these emergency situations is the importance of breath. Is the uh, importance of breath and deep breathing. Uh, it's important to be able to manage stress perfectly and uh, understand that you should be dialing 911 and providing detailed information and the address of the location where the issue is happening at. Also, uh, during the emergency, there should be multiple rallies for the staff to organize that outside. So uh, different places where after the emergency is over that people can come and uh, they can manage the situation. So we're going to talk about uh, just a brief uh, thing on awareness. So uh, there's been many, many, many cases of active shooters and active attackers where they have had very, very uh, suspicious behaviors before an incident. So in Quebec City, the perpetrator actually came into the mosque two times beforehand and was arguing with the uh, religious leader, the imam, or uh, the equivalent of the priest, and uh, made some very, very uh, suggestive comments. And uh, this was actually not escorted to the police. In New York, uh, in January 2019, in a, in a community of Islamburg, uh, there was a whole Muslim community, and four men had actually amassed 21 guns and three explosives. In an attempt to actually uh, to basically slaughter everybody in that community. And they were actually only stopped because somebody reported them to the police. Uh, but he saw something suspicious going on. In Nova Scotia, uh, the shooter in Nova Scotia uh, back in, I believe, April, he, uh, he actually, uh, on, upon further investigation, there were several very worrying signs that he was uh, uh, showing. Right? So it's important to report all this to the police, to different stakeholders in your organization, and understand that even false alarms, there's still a trading opportunity for you to understand things. Uh, when it comes to the more event management side of things, you want to have a greeting committee 
uh, that's at the door that is trained in understand, like understanding signs of suspicious behavior. I'm using uh, this a chart of Jeff Cooper's uh, uh, awareness model, where he talks about the different stages of a person being aware. Uh, white is a bird, and this is usually, you know, technically you should only be in this situation when you're sleeping, where you're completely un unaware and you're not ready for anything. Uh, most people, unfortunately, are in this situation a lot of the time. Yellow is where, when you're awake, you should really be in this stage uh, a lot. This is a mental state that you need to be in, where you just you're 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 relaxed. There's nothing going on, but you just you you're always checking to make sure that you're ready to move to the next level. Orange is obviously things very specific has happened, and you're you're ready to start taking action. Red is an action mode where you're totally committed. So you, there is an emergency now, and you need to react to it. Right? And so you're very aware of your surroundings. Black is uh, system overload, which is, that's panic really, and you need to avoid that at all costs. So it's important to understand that there's signs of suspicious activity if people are acting aggressively or uh, they're saying things that are very worrying. Uh, listen to your gut instinct and believe in your gut instinct. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit all about the communication. So I'm only going to talk about one real example, which is Rick Rascorla, who was uh, a, uh, the chief security officer of Morgan Stanley during 9-11. Now, Rick Rascorla had, uh, had a career in the London Metropolitan Police in the UK and had been uh, fighting in the Vietnam War. So he was quite well aware of how to communicate properly and the signs of an emergency. During 9-11, he, uh, the New York Port Authority at the time, uh, told everybody to stay at their desks uh, when the first plane crashed into the buildings. He uh, was of the opposite uh, nature, and he basically told everybody to get out. And he gave very clear instructions to everybody in the building on how to evacuate and where to go. He saved 2,687 people on that day because of his leadership. And it's really important that you understand that uh, taking that kind of action and being very clear and, uh, and you know communicating very clearly that there is an emergency is very important. You don't want to. People are not stupid, right? Uh, they're going to understand that something is wrong. So one thing we need to learn is learn how to breathe properly, learn how to calm down during our everyday lives. And I just wanted to uh, really touch upon that whole uh, the concept of having a parking patrol, an internal team, an external team, and perhaps a camera operator as the best way to build a better security measure. Okay, so now we're going to talk about run, hide, defend, which is uh, what the police in the United States and Canada uh, have really been uh, promoting these last several years. So during an emergency, your brain uses shortcuts and will only want to use familiar paths. Uh, so the, the applied, what that means is that you will only go to the places that your brain is actually physically familiar with. It doesn't matter if you've seen that uh, exit point on a map or on a, on a picture or something like that or, you know, across the hallway. Unless you've actually been through that area physically yourself, your brain won't recognize it as a possibility because our, our brains are still like evolved from like a caveman era where, you know, it, it, it tries to organize these thoughts around where they've actually been. So during any event, it's really a good idea to walk around the building and understand where you can get to safety. Uh, you can, in a school context or a community context, you'd really want to encourage games like hide and seek and scavenger hunts for uh, children, right? You'd want to encourage people to actually explore their uh, surroundings and be mindful of them so that they know what they can do. Hide. You so if you, yeah? Can I ask a question? Sure. I guess it would be good, particularly in schools, for children to understand what makes a good place to hide versus what makes a bad place to hide as well, and familiarizing yourself mm -hmm. about what's going to be helpful and what's not. Do you have any advice about what is a, a not good place to hide? So actually, that is the, that is the slide here, which is the hide portion. And... See, so we need to understand that there's a difference between uh, cover and concealment. Uh, a lot of places, they will conceal you, but they may not cover you because uh, bullets, as we know, can travel through 
lots of different objects. And uh, so things like a like some some very thin walls, they will likely not be a good defense uh, if the shooter knows that you know there's people behind it, right? So that's something important. But hide really is a second. Uh, it's sort of the second resort, which is uh, you know, if you can't run away, you find a place to hide, minimize noise, and you turn off the, uh, turn off the lights in the area. You try to make it look as if nobody's there. Uh, and a really good idea is that you have actually heavy objects near doors all the time, like bookshelves. So you could actually collapse those bookshelves on the doors so then the attacker can't come in. Uh, obviously, silence your phones. Don't turn them off because you need to contact law enforcement. And understand that law enforcement takes five to six minutes. During an emergency, the pe people on the ground, they are the emergency response. Until law enforcement gets there, uh, you, are, you, are the, you are the response, right? And your actions during that time make the difference between life and death. We can look at examples like the Parkland shooting where uh, many teachers broke protocol uh, in order to save more children. And uh, that worked very well because their protocol was they barricade whoever's in the room at the time and uh, nobody's allowed in or out. Now, the thing is that sometimes that can work and sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, we see both examples in the Parkland shooting. So we saw many where uh, there, are, uh, there, were, there are teachers who actually uh, let in lots of students, right? And they weren't supposed to do that and they saved a lot of lives through that. Uh, many, many teachers have put themselves in the line of fire to save more students. And uh, some of them ended up saving many. Some of them actually ended up getting killed. So it's really important to understand that you've got to use your own judgment. We can only provide uh, advice to you, right? Now, I'm going to talk about the uh, last uh, resort, which is the one that really, it's only if there's no other options. And I don't want to... Uh, encourage anybody to actually engage in this unless there's no other choice between you or death. So it's important to understand that there's a lot of shootings that have ended because a shooter, the shooter was actually stopped by somebody in the crowd, right? The New Zealand shooting was ended only because uh, a gentleman from one of the mosques actually ran and picked up a credit card machine of all things and chased the man out. This person had already killed 50 something people and he had already, you know, slaughtered, but one person fighting back was enough to, you know, scare the person. I mean, to understand that criminals by their nature are suspicious and cowardly, right? The Denver school shooting, uh, another one where uh, they're in Colorado, Denver, Denver, Colorado, there was uh, an individual who got up in class and started shooting his classmates and three kids jumped on him. And it ended up that only one of those kids passed away, but they actually stopped dozens of children from, potentially from being killed from that one shooting. We have the Norway shooting, which is another mosque shooting, right? That's our specialty uh, in terms of, uh, you know, trying to research this stuff. In, Nor in the Norway mosque shooting, not a single person died because an old 65-year-old man who was formerly from the Air Force actually jumped on the guy. And this, this, uh, this active shooter, he actually had two shot. He had, a, he had a number of very heavy tactical weapons like a shotgun and uh, body armor and I believe pistols, uh, a, lo a lot of gear and a helmet as well. And, this one six and he, was a tw he was in his 20s and this one 65-year-old man jumped on him and stop the attack entirely. Nobody died, right? So it's important to understand that you can do something. It doesn't matter if you're a wheelchair or if you're a trained soldier. You have the opportunity to help other people. Uh, understand that the brain takes about 1.9 seconds to react to somebody and pull a trigger on something. So I, I uh, train in uh, Krav Maga uh, when the lockdown's not, not going on. I train in Krav Maga a little bit. And uh, we have a rule called the 1.9 second rule, which is how long the brain takes to react to somebody uh, trying to attack them, right? And uh, the reaction time, it, it works every single time where the person cannot pull the trigger before somebody makes a reaction to that. So understand that you do have time uh, to fight back. 
obviously this is very dangerous and I don't want to encourage anybody to do that, but know that if you are doing it, if you do commit to that, you need to commit fully. And there actually is, there are chances that you can survive and actually protect other people. Now overwhelm the attacker using light and sound. Uh, that's very important. So, you know, you can, you can, uh, we're getting more into tactics here, but things like, you know, surprising them with blinding lights or, uh, you know, making sounds, right, to uh, distract them, right? That can be very, very effective. Throwing objects around, right? If, if, if the attacker is moving through a premises and he doesn't have a visual on you, you can very, very, very easily uh, disrupt his focus, right? Because he's actually, uh, you know, one thing that we have in the financial sector we say is that, you know, Criminals are actually just as afraid of uh, afraid as everybody who they're attacking, right? Robbers, bank robbers are, you know, they're very afraid because they're risking everything right now, right? Technically, right? In terms of, you know, their life and stuff, right? For this act of crime. Now, a gunman can only focus on one target at a time. So for these big congregations like mosques or churches or synagogues, you need to understand that there's power in numbers. You need to, you know, come together as a group and uh, you know he may be able to shoot one of us but he can't shoot all of us right uh, this has been proven time and again uh, there was a sh shooting in uh, seven kings moss in uh, London where the entire congregation jumped on the attacker and the attacker ran out, ran out of the mosque it's important to use improvised weapons as well so things like any kind of books or any chairs that you could see tables everything right and we have the evidence to prove that this works because from 2000 to 2013, there was an FBI study conducted on shootings and uh, there's 21 shootings that were stopped by citizens. So, uh, you know, there is a difference that can be made during these mass incidents. There's other events like the Long Island tra train shooting, if you're interested in learning more about this stuff, uh, but I'm not going to go into it any further in the interest of time. The last thing, which is probably, uh, sorry, Craig, do you have anything to add that you'd like to ask? Now, this is really good. It's very informative and understandable. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, so, the next thing I would uh, ask is about uh, Stop the Bleed. So, this is actually a program that was created because of the almost epidemic levels of uh, active shootings that were going on within the United States. Uh, you know, in the last five, six years, there have been so many in different schools specifically, right? And all these, you know, uh, you know, I would call them criminals, but honestly, criminal is a little bit too soft of a word to use for these types of people, right? They go in and they, you know, decide to end the life of all these innocent children, right, for no other reason, like for, for you know, seemingly no reason. Obviously, there's a very complex psychological makeup to that, and I'm not going to get into advanced criminological concepts right now, but, uh, but that's a separate hate crime seminar on what causes a person to hate. But the pro point is, is that... Uh, because of all these shootings that were continuing to uh, develop and continue, right? Uh, this uh, program was developed by a lot of medical professionals across the United States, and it was promoted by President Obama. Stop the bleed, right? So what is that? That's very simply, many people during an emergency, they're actually too afraid to deliver first aid training, or sorry, first aid, because they're like, they're afraid of making the situation worse. But what you have to understand is that if the person's already having a bleeding, in, a severe bleeding injury or some, some kind of trauma, it's actually, it's general medical practice that you, there's not much that you can do to make the situation worse. In fact, in most cases, your actions could actually make the situation better. So the simple thing we want to talk about is applying pressure with a cloth to stop bleeding. You can greatly increase the chance of a person surviving, get the blood to coagulate and harden, um, you know, and there have been many times, so uh, one of our, um, one of our uh, team members, our project lead actually, uh, was actually, uh, he actually responded to an active shooting uh, in the Canada area, and uh, he was actually second officer on scene, and uh, he actually had to do this, a very same thing, where the paramedics were several minutes away, and a person was bleeding out in front of him, Right, and he had to start delivering first aid and uh, protecting the person's life. Right, and he actually, because of his actions, he saved that person's life. So it's really important to understand that you know you don't need to know much. Just understand that you need to stop the bleeding, no matter what. Just keep stuffing cloth in because 
bullet wounds can leave a lot of trauma and very large wound uh, wounds, right? And it's important to keep stuff in cloth in. Uh, you, you know, there's obviously applications of tourniquets. Uh, unfortunately, uh, beyond training for myself, I am not qualified as a first aid instructor. And uh, uh, I'm going to leave it at that. But uh, this is something that you really need to look up. And uh, there's infographics that I can provide uh, that are very helpful. Uh, so that's all I've got for today. And uh, that was the full presentation. I hope you found it useful. Uh, these are just some very basic principles that we share with the different mosques, churches, and schools. And uh, actually, to, as of tomorrow, food banks. Uh, uh, this is uh, the, uh, you know, these are the principles that we share with them uh, in order to have themselves better protected. It's important that you understand that you are not helpless during an emergency. You're absolutely not. You are actually in a position to help the most amount of people. Unfortunately, our uh, society and uh, you know, we've been conditioned and programmed to believe that we are helpless. And the news, unfortunately, always portrays to us the times when it's the absolute worst. So we need to understand that we need to have the confidence that, you know, um, sure, I may not be able to, you know, I, I'm not going to be James Bond and, you know, like, you know, take, like, take down the attacker and completely solve the situation. No harm done. I, I'm, you know, but you can actually make a huge difference that can impact a lot of lives and save a lot of people. Eunice, this has been really, really helpful. I know that you've created a number of graphics to help people understand. Um, we'd love to include those graphics with your video training. Do you have time just before we finish to just show those graphics on the screen for us? And then um, people can know what they're looking for. Do you have those available? Was, uh, it, was this regarding the pandemic in uh, 1033? It was the graphics uh, was, that you sent me. Yeah, one second. Let me just see if... Uh, <clears throat> Particularly right now when there are large crowds gathering for protesting, um, how to keep yourself safe when you're doing being involved in a large gathering, just so people can see them and know what they're looking for. Yeah, one moment, please. Let me just get that out there. Sure. I think as um, countries like New Zealand and Australia, which don't have a history of a large number of active shooter situations, though, as you know, New Zealand has had a, a couple of very terrible ones. I think because schools do earthquake drills, fire drills, we could certainly add in, in countries like New Zealand and Australia, an active shooter drill, or at least make people aware, students aware, senior students aware, because unfortunately it's becoming a fact of life. So what I'll add to that actually is that uh, me and uh, so my, our team, right, which is also made of law enforcement officers and <clears throat> our, um, our team, which is made of law enforcement officers and our, uh, like, you know, our, our liaison with other law enforcement agencies, we've had a lot of discussions around this. And one of the things that we've uh, all, you know, one of the things that we've all uh, talked about actually at length is that the principles that we're talking about here, run, hide, defend, stop the bleeding, be aware, these things are actually translatable to any emergency, right? Mm. So what, what the thing is, is that, you know, you, you, uh, you may think that, you know, you might be, you know, wait, how does that apply to a fire? But actually think about it. You have a threat. Right, which is the fire itself, yes. and then you actually have the, like, you know running away from the threat, creating as much distance as possible, barricading yourself in, right, uh, from the fire, and making sure this uh, the airways are blocked so that the fire can't spread. Then you have actually fighting the fire, which is you know uh, taking firefighting equipment like you know water water hoses and these sorts of things, right, uh, to fight the to actively engage with the fire, right. Uh, with with other emergencies, it's basically a very a very uh, a general frame a generalized framework of you getting away from the threat, you putting a barrier to the threat, and then you actually engaging with the threat. It's a decision making thing on you know what's the most important priority. So what mm -hmm. I'm going to do is I'm actually going to share um, the uh, the images right now. Just give me one second. Let me just uh... just for everybody watching, what we will do is have links available.
with the video and with this training to these graphics as well. Also links to the Salam project and Eunice's profile as well on LinkedIn. All right, here we go. So my apologies for a little bit. Uh, you know, I actually don't have this else all set up, but let's try and share screen now. Okay, so this is the first one that I wanted to talk about, which was, uh, so these are just some measures that you can uh, take during a uh, large mass gathering, right? And uh, this was actually created for a lot of the protests. We, we understand that we're trying not to, uh, we're not trying to encourage people to protest, but we know that they're going to uh, protest anyway. So for all those people who are going to do it, we wanted to give them, uh, you know, the, uh, the tools with which they could better protect themselves. Because if we can prevent the spread even by 1%, that saves a lot of people's lives, right? So understand that before protests, you take uh, online COVID-19 self-assessments, uh, get, getting tested prior, wearing your face shields and glasses, uh, and you know, obviously your masks, uh, making sure you avoid high touch surfaces and uh, trying to avoid shouting because that can spread the virus actually uh, very much more louder, like a more forceful uh, exhalation, right? That can, like shouting, that can really spread the virus. Make sure you shower and wash your clothes after the protest thoroughly, get tested after, isolate as well, right, yourself. Uh, maintain a six feet distance at all times during the protest and uh, carry uh, water, hand sanitizer and bandages. Now, this is uh, the 1033 network, which I'm helping out, which is a, a group of emergency managers. All, all, of our, uh, all of our work is open source. We just provide it, uh, you know, we've, we've spent months uh, working on this, uh, these materials for uh, these sorts of mass gatherings. And then, yeah, there's a, there's a couple other ones. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'll share the rest of them with you in the future, uh, if you'd like. And we can actually have another webinar on that. Uh, specifically, I'll create a PowerPoint on that. Would that be, I think that would be probably best, right? That would be really good. Eunice, I really want to yeah. thank you for contributing so openly and so willingly. I know that you are, you are very busy and you do your consultation as well as your full-time job. So thank you for sharing so yeah. openly and willingly. And I know that it comes from a heart to train people and equip people and keep people safe. So thank you for what you're doing. And we're, we're delighted to have you as one of our contributing faculty members. I'm, I'm honored. Um, you know, it's funny because I actually have to leave it about five minutes for my night shift. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say that it's, it's very, uh, I'm just happy to help other people. And to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter to me, um, you know, what the method is, right? As long as it's getting to people and this information is being disseminated, it doesn't have to be through me. It can be with one of my teammates, right? As long as we're doing that, uh, you know, I'm happy to support anything. So uh, thank you for giving us a platform for doing this and uh, for assisting uh, other people with it, like, you know, these very, very important educational things that we need to do. So thank you.